are going to talk about data-oriented programming in Java. Um, two things up front. It's data-oriented programming. It is not like data streaming and manipulating data stream. That is not the intention of data-oriented programming. Data-oriented programming is a paradigm like functional programming or object-oriented programming. Um, so that was the first thing. Um, and the second thing is, uh, yesterday, actually, Mala, Mala Gupta, she had a session here. Was anyone here at her session? Yes, you were. I can remember that. That's very good that the rest wasn't, because Mala had a session, and it was announced as something like, oh, data-focused programming in Java. And I thought, oh, well, sounds interesting. I'll go there. And then she put on the first lead sheet and said, data-oriented programming in Java. And I thought, no. I traveled three and a half thousand miles for nothing because she already did the presentation. <laughs> but turned out it wasn't exactly the same. It was a brilliant session. You should definitely look it back in the recordings. Um, I'm going to, some of part is rehearsal, but that's, or repeating, but that's only for you. Um, for the rest, um, um, I have a little different approach. So um, let's have a look. If there's any questions at any time, I'll just suggest we ask them and pass around the microphone. Okay, this is about me. I just heard 15 years. I suddenly lost five years because he is still stage 20. So that's good, um, even though the wrinkles are quite visible. Um, I work at a Dutch IT company, so I just work for normal customers like I guess most of you. Um, currently working at the Dutch tax office. Um, and I am what we call a special agent, and it allows us to travel normally around Europe. This was kind of a luxury exception to be, uh, to be able to come to India, so that was a really great experience. And I'm currently uh, writing a book with a colleague of mine about cloud native migration in Jakarta. Right, what's the agenda for today? Um, the evolution of traditional applications, because that's what we all come from, right? We write a normal object-oriented code, and um, maybe that should change, or maybe partially it should change. So we'll look at first how things started out. Then we'll do a little dive into, okay, what is this data-oriented programming, so that we have a bit of background on what it is all about. Then we're going to look at, okay, how does modern Java actually support these things? And that's actually what Marla was talking a lot about yesterday. And actually also this morning, Kenneth, Kenneth Cousin, if anyone was there, he had a great session too about what's new in Java. And finally, we're going to look at some real world code examples of how to apply these data oriented patterns to Java. Right. Evolution of an application. So this is a short story I'm going to tell to you now. And then we, hear, we have Pranav. And he's a developer. He's a developer at a company and he's an internal developer. And Pranav is a happy developer because he is a developer who loves timesheets. Now, I guess this is something we're all familiar with, right? We have to do it monthly, maybe weekly. Or if you're really unlucky, you have to do it on a daily basis where you have to enter your timesheet information. But Pranav doesn't matter because he's the one at the company developing the timesheet application. And that is actually quite a simple application. Um, I still hope it's a bit visible in the back. It says something like, okay, we have a timesheet header, we have details, and there's a user, and... Uh, we have projects and we can do certain activities like designing, developing, and that all works well. And the company works well and, and, and people start adding this information. And then one day, the project manager, I can guess you can see who's the project manager here, that's the unhappy one. He comes and he says, wait a minute, Pranav, there's a problem now. I mean, there are people actually writing time on my projects which are not part of my project. And Pranav has to think about it, and he says, mm, yeah, could be. Basically, everyone is allowed to do anything here, so we need to change the system. So we introduce an extra coupling, and that's how it is, right? This is how our information systems grow when our classes come. And after a short while, the manager is back. He says, well, great, that doesn't happen anymore, but now 
um, we have this project where we're developing an API. And I suddenly see that someone is registering hours on a front end task. Can't be. And Pranav has another thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see where that happens. And we need to introduce project activities where we can only say, okay, these activities are allowed for these projects. And the company prospers. And more employees arrive. So the company grows and grows. And before you know it, suddenly we have a more need for managers in the company. So now there's not just regular users and project managers. There's also approvers now who approve your timesheets and come with the nasty questions. So the system grows and grows. And then it becomes multi-tenant. So there's multiple companies who need to be able to work on it. So we get organizations in. And then, of course, we need more reports and timesheets. And this is the normal evolution of applications that we all know, I guess. This is how we normally design our systems and how we can see how, how, how new features are being stacked on top of the other one. And this is clearly the realm in which object-oriented programming that we are all using in Java has been, um, has been prospering. So this is the real part. Now, if you would look at a code example, I hope you can actually look at it, um, you'll see this would be a typical thing. It's a user bean. It doesn't matter. It could be a spring bean. It could be a, a session bean, a, a Jakarta, or for the older ones, JEE -E session bean. And it contains both data and it contains business logic. So we have an email, a password, um, um, whether the account is active, and how many login attempts, um, unsuccessful attempts have been made. And, and, and we can see that um, there's here this message that says um, um, register failed login attempt. And basically what it does, it says, okay, the user has tried to log in and it fails. Okay, then we're going to increase the failed count. And if that reaches a certain threshold, we are going to lock the user account. So suddenly we can see that actually business logic and state they're intermingling, right? They're, they're, they're working together. So this is typically how we used to work like this. State and logic contained in one bean. But our applications are changing. These are, well, monolithic always sounds very like negative, right? It's never meant like that, but these are large application made of large domain models models and this is where object orientation and object oriented program shines though if you would split this application into smaller applications and more and more we can actually see it who here actually is working on some kind of a microservice architecture oh thankfully a go ah. Well, more and more hands are actually rising. And that's basically a whole new way of developing, right? You don't need these enormous object structures anymore. You don't have these business processes that are spanning multiple classes and beans. And we do the same with this application. And if you would look, then we could see, oh, if you would identify different domains, not even talking microservices, but, but domains, we could have here a user domain, and probably here we would have the timesheet header domain. There would be the activities domain. Different scaling methods, different needs. And there could be like something like authorization here where we can say, okay, who's allowed to do what? So, and, and this is a bit what data-oriented programming is all about. It is going to tell you, okay, um, our applications are becoming smaller, so maybe we should use a different way to approach that. So what is data orientation? First of all, it's not a new concept. It has been around for like, I don't know, probably as long as functional programming. And the important part here is to understand it is not native to the JVM. So it's not native to Java, it's actually language agnostic. And it is based on four principles. We'll look at four principles and then dive into a bit of 
detail. First of all, it became very popular because Brian Getz, somewhere in, when was it, 2021, had this article where he wrote about data-oriented programming in Java. Brian Getz is the language architect, and he showed how all these new features in Java really makes the language suited for this new programming style. Um, then Nicola Parlor came, and there was a Java newscast, which you can find on YouTube, where it was talked about, and then Gavin Bierman, actually, in the context of Java 1, also explained it. You can look back at these videos, and they basically give you a bit more context. So, data-oriented programming, like I said, four principles. First one, separate data from logic. The second would be, data is stored in generic data structures. The third would be, data is immutable. And the fourth one is that you actually, data schema, so what is the data, what type of data is separate from the representations. Now, let's have a look at each of these principles in a bit more detail. Okay, separate data from logic. So the business logic and the data should be separated. Um, before we had the example with the user that got blocked, right, if the number of attempts was, um, was passed, and um, that was for a regular normal user, and then, oh, later we introduced the, the, the manager and the approver, and we probably want that logic there too. Still, um, how would we do that? Um, 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 one way would be to duplicate the logic in the separate classes, right? Um, but I hope as a Java developer, we all would see, now we probably make an abstract class user, put the logic in there, and let the rest inherit. So we only have it in one place. Well, that would be the normal object-oriented way. Perfect. Um, what, if we would separate data from logic, we could do it in a separate way. We could have the logic here, have a user class, pass it to the logic, and it doesn't matter if it's a regular user, an approver, or a project manager, it will all be the same. And if you think about it, this isn't very strange, because who's working with the Spring Framework? That's quite a few. And my personal favorites, are there any people working with Jakarta? J, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> you saved my day then. Uh, no one Jakarta, not even Java EE, Enterprise Java Beans? Oh God, I'm on the wrong horse, <laughs> okay. Well, never mind, then we'll take the Spring Beans. In Spring, you would do the same here, right? Because you have your Spring Beans and they're prototype beans and basically they don't hold state, right? If you have annotated them with um, at session, they won't hold state. Oh, sorry, not at session, at service, of course. And it's the same with uh, the Jakarta beans. There you would have stateless session beans, which by name already don't have state. So it makes this separation of data and state actually make sense. And that may uh, lead to reusing code in different contexts. The, test, the second one would be testing in isolation. The session before was about all about testing and API testing. Um, this idea is, okay, it's easier to test because if, you have a, if data and logic is in one class, then it's harder to set up the class to create good test classes. Um, here, basically, you just have to create a simple user object, pass it on, and it will all work. Um, General, it leads to less complex systems. Well, the system as a whole will still be quite complex. We just have chopped it into smaller sections. And these smaller sections, they will have a smaller class hierarchy. And also, um, the mix of business and data is taken away. So, although you might have more classes than when you would join them together, they still are um, easier to grasp. So, your mental picture is easier of it. Next thing would be that we say we store data in generic data structures. And generic data structures would actually be lists, maps, queues, uh, whatever, those things, sets in Java. 
they come with a few advantages. It will allow for a flexible data model. If I would decide, um, oh, I, I want to have this property on there saying, mm, is this an admin user? I could simply add the key is admin to the map and then the value. So, so basically, it would be an easier option. And there's this thing that you could use generic functions. This is basically an argument that is used a lot. But I think we work in a Java environment. And I think we are lucky to have one of the richest environments. So I don't think this one really applies to us. The idea is from there's some libraries out there which are written to manipulate strings, for instance. Well, I, I think Java has great support for that anyway. Right. Um, data should be immutable. Well, immutability is all about. Um, you can change the reference to the data, of course you can change the reference, but you can't change the data, right? And um, you can return a new object with new values, but you're not changing the objects as we use them here. Um, this gives predictable behavior because if somewhere your code is going from here to here, and it could change anywhere in these places, and it would do so, and you would have a bug, uh, then you would have to look everywhere in these places to find out where did the data get mutated. Though if you have sep clearly defined points where you can mutate the data, then it's much easier to find out where things went wrong. And finally, of course, uh, immutability gives us safer concurrency because we can access the same data. It can be accessed by multiple threads at the same time. It's not going to change, so uh, we won't get any race conditions. The final argument, separating schema from representation, has all to do with how do you express the shape of your data. Some languages, they can be like, you know, they can be type agnostic. They don't really know what type it is. Um, or at least it's not specifically in the data itself. Um, typically, well, we talked about JSON before and XML. Basically, if you see an XML, you don't know exactly what type something is. There's an external description in the XSD or in a JSON schema that tells this. Right. That's all about the short intro to this. Now we get to Java and how Java supports data-oriented programming. So we're going to look at records, sealed classes, pattern matching, and uh, switch functions for pattern matching. OK, starting with records. Who's familiar with records? Right, there's a few people here. Nice. Because I already saw them um, a few times in this conference that they were mentioned. Um, and this is something that you really want to look at. This is something that I think it came in Java 14. And it's really, really um, a great change. Records, they're basically data carriers. The data carriers, you can really create them in a very, this is all it takes to create a record with four fields, right? And um, they're really small and concise. You can pass them around in your system. They're ideal for data transport between your components. Now, what we see, of course, here is, does it actually point? Not really. Oh, there it is. Um, well, public record. Normally, you would say classy, and now it says public record. Um, so that's a new keyword, and then you can specify all the instance fields that make up your data record. And when I say um, um, instance fields, they're, instant, they're final instance variables, actually, meaning as soon as the constructor is completed, they must have their final value and cannot be changed. So they're immutable. Might come in handy later. Um, they're very easy to use and create. I can basically say, well, use the new keyword, give the values, and then we have a record. We have here four instance variables. Like I said, they're immutable. So immutable. So um, we can't change them, right? So um, where with normal classes, you would have like the Java bean convention with getters, setters. Here, technically, we only have getters. Um, it's just not getters anymore. You can just use the name of the field, and then you would get the value returned. And well, it comes with a few other things. It gives you the equals, the hash code, the two string, all the blah, blah, blah that you normally get. Um, it also comes with something which is called 
uh, a compact constructor. Normally, this would be kind of the constructor, the kind of, uh, uh, but it can come with a compact constructor which looks like this, and it's compact because you don't specify the parameters. And basically, there's no need to because the compiler knows, right? He knows you defined the record up there. He knows which parameters he's going to get. So he says, don't worry telling me. I, I, I know what they are. And then you can actually do your validations here. And this is important. Also, imagining you're having some microservice with a REST API and data comes in. Well, the first thing you might want to do, first line of defense, is validating that data. Well, for a record that is perfect, for its internal state to validate already in the constructor here. So you could say required, not no. And the fields we're using here, they are actually the fields that come in as parameters, so they're not the instance variables. In fact, you can't set them here. Um, what you also see is that we're actually not setting the parameters to the instance variables. That's something the compiler takes care of. Once this Compact constructor completes the compilers. Ah, okay, now I've got the values. I'll pass them on to the instance variables. Second thing is sealed classes. Can't remember. I think they were added in Java 15 or 16. And the whole idea of sealed classes is about hierarchy and, 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 and inheritance. Um, Basically, in Java, you can have two options if you think about you got a class, and if you say, I don't want anyone inheriting from my class, well, then we'll make it final, right? You, no one can inherit from it, uh, but neither can you then. Uh, the other option is you leave the final out, which basically, well, depending on accessor, could mean that you got a public method. So that's very coarse grained, right? Either it's no one, or technically everyone. Um, and sealed classes are meant to give you a bit more control over inheritance. And sealed classes um, also allow the compiler to reason about, okay, about completeness. Are you being complete here? And if you're not, the compiler will tell you and he will warn you. Um, everywhere where I say sealed classes, the same applies to sealed interfaces. So a sealed class is made like this. You say, or sealed interface. A sealed interface user, and then you have the permits clause. And then you say, right, only the approver, the project manager, and the regular user, they are allowed to inherit from me. So that suddenly you know, narrows the scope of who's allowed to use your classes. Then each of the classes mentioned in uh, the permits clause, well, they need to state themselves how they are reacting with people trying to inherit from them. Um, well, the most basic method is, of course, that in this case, the approver says, well, I also use a permits clause and I'm sealed, so I allow two others to inherit from me. A second option would be, in case of the project manager, we say, nah, that's final. We've got enough project managers, no more. So it's final, and it just works like a normal final in any class. And the third option would be, oh, no, that was one too quick. Non-sealed. This is actually the first little detail, non-hyphened uh, hyphened keyword in Java. We never had a non-sealed with a minus in between there or something. Um, so, so this whole sealed class, if you think about it, added a lot, like four keywords to the Java language. It was quite a big thing, not only from, 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 from technique, but also how it uh, kind of changes uh, the classes and, 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 and the registered names in a Java thing. So non-sealed basically says, you know what? I don't care, anyone can inherit from me. And that may sound weird at first because you think, I built a very careful hierarchy, who can inherit? And then I suddenly say, well, I don't care anymore, just do your thing. But to the compiler, any class inheriting from a regular user will always be an instance of a regular user. So we can always um, um, reason about it, which we see later, as being an instance of that. 
Anyone using sealed classes? Yeah, I thought so. I actually only saw, even in the JVM, if you look at the source code for the JVM, uh, I only saw one place where sealed classes were used. And this was actually in, uh, in the threading class, because as you all might know, we're now getting virtual threads in Java, right? Um, so suddenly, um, there's two types of threads. We have normal threads, like, like the classical platform threads, and we have virtual threads. And there, I saw the sealed interface actually being used. That's the only place I could find in the whole JVM itself. So uh, don't feel bad if you're not using it. But I'm quite sure that after this, and the examples we're going to look at in a bit, you're going to love it. Um, right. So that's all about sealed classes. Um, then one of the final pieces of the puzzle, and then it all going to fit together. They all might seem nice as they are, but when used together, they're extremely strong. So pattern matching. First, we should look at what is a pattern in Java. Well, you have a predicate, which basically is a test, something that returns to a normal predicate. You have an object against which you're going to use this predicate. And if this test is successful, it might lead to certain pattern variables. That means, um, well, we're going to look at an example in a bit. And these pattern vari variables, they're always in flow scope. So let's look at an example. Here it says, return user instance of approver. Now, that might have been normal. You could have also written that in Java. But now there's this little a here at the back. So it, it, it's not your normal instance of anymore. This is a different one, um, although it's still just the same. The predicate here is instance of approver. Is this class an instance of that appro of approver? Uh, user is the object we're testing against. And if the comp if the runtime says, yeah, yeah, you're right. Actually, user it is an instance of approver. Then what it will do for you is assign the user to um, 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 the instance variable A, but then cast it as an, as an approver. So basically, that's your basic cast. Doesn't seem very fancy here right now, but we'll get to some more, more fancy situations in a bit. Um, well, the flow scope basically just means that the A is only between these um, uh, brackets. It is actually available and in scope. Um, we can use that also with the switch pattern matching. And now we're slowly getting into the realm of data-oriented programming because data-oriented programming is all about that data is a first-class citizen. Well, that sounds very functional programming-like, right? And, um, but it is. And really, you're making decisions based on your data, on the data itself. So um, here, for instance, we say allow approving. So we're sending in a user. Does the user have the right to allow approving? So now we can use a switch. And as you might see, this is a switch function because it returns a value. We all know the switch statement. But since uh, Java 14 or 15, switch has now two functions. And this is actually. Um, the switch labeled rule, this one is called, because you have this error operator here, and then you can just say, OK, this is the return value without you specifying return. And it has a few other things. It has, doesn't have a fall through anymore. Um, um, so once it matches, it will go to the end. Um, but again, it is a function. And that's the important thing here. And what we're now saying, basically, OK, that user, um, um, is it an approver? If so, will return true. And if it's a project manager or a regular, u a regular user, it will turn false. Important thing here is to see that we are really making decisions now based on the data we are sending in. And this can go a step further, because in Java 17, there was also something like a guarded pattern. So suddenly, you see this here in the case. Suddenly, um, you have this when construction here where you can actually say, OK, wait a minute. I want this case. Generally, I want to know if this is an approver. But I only want to return true is it, if it is still an active approver. 
So that is what is called the guarded pattern. One thing you might actually be m seen missing from here is the default clause. There's no default clause. So basically, why is there no default? Because we're passing in a user, and how do we know? How does the compiler know that you caught all situations? Well, the compiler knows because he looked at the hierarchy. He saw that the user can only have three types, right? The regular user, the approver, and the project manager. So he knows there's no default man needed here. Yet, we see approver twice here. Can anyone see, does anyone know why we're using it twice here? Yeah, yes, <coughs> keep stumbling, eh? Um, this one only catches the active approvers, correct? And if, um, if you would leave this one out, then the compiler would say, hey, wait a minute, mate. You put, you put a restriction on which approvers we're talking about there, so we're missing a group. So now you need a default case. So, um, but as we're putting it in here, you don't have to use it. And let's be honest, having switches without defaults is actually quite nice. Um, moving on, because it didn't stop there in Java... 20, we got, no, it was 19, record pattern matching. And this is a, well, new ball game. Let, let, let's have a look at it. So we can use this, a user record, and we can do the instance of on the user record. Isn't very interesting. But now we can also do something like this. Um, first of all, one thing switch gave us is now we can do a case null. All these new switches can use that. Before, if you had a switch statement, you always had to check first, oh, wait a minute, if I'm checking A, if A not is null, because if you wouldn't do it and you would check against it, you would get a null pointer exception, right? Um, so now you can actually handle it here and return, ah, okay, that's not what I want. Um, the second one, this case here, is very interesting because we have the user record with these four fields. And what I'm telling the compiler here now is, you know, if this is an instance of user record uh, with a string, a string, a boolean, and an integer, could you then please take these instance variables out and store them in the variables E, P, B, and A? So basically, it does some deconstruction here. It takes the instance variables from the record and places them in the variables that you have here. And it got even a bit better in Java 20, because then we could actually don't have to say the types anymore. We could just say to the compiler, oh, you know what? Um, this is a user record. You know the type, so you, you figure it out. So, so that is, makes it easier for you to think about. And actually, there is a Java enhancement proposal, because here I'm only using the E and the B. And there's a proposal now where they say, you know what? The ones you don't use, you can just put an underscore there and then ignore it, like many languages already do. So this is all pattern matching. Um, they did one final enhancement. We have the enhanced for loop, right? So you say for, and then you say, oh, user over a list of users, and then you iterate to e through each of them. Well, that allows now for direct record de deconstruction as well. So you can now simply say, okay, uh, do it like this and then use the variables. So not the instance variables, but the variables. It seems like there's going to be more changes to this pattern matching. The, the next thing there might want to have a look at is array deconstructions, where you can actually take array elements already out. Uh, so there's quite a few ideas still there. And of course, here you can also use the var keyword. Right, now we get to the part um, where we're going to mix code, um, Java code with all these things. Um, any questions so far? Nice, then we'll... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, the case. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, um, for the record, I guess. You, you didn't meet this, you didn't meet... Yes. Yeah. Why?
Are we talking here? Well, um, it says, uh, okay, if it is an approver, uh, an A, and then I can use the A and I can say, if A is active, then it should return true, which means allow approving. And, oh, oh, you mean that the A is in twice there? Ah, okay. Um, it will actually, that's actually quite a good question, thinking about it. Actually, with guarded patterns, um, you have to do it this way. If I would have done it the other way around, it would always have picked one, because, ah, first match, are you approved? Yes, I am. Okay, great, then you're out. Um, in this case, um, and this A, actually, it can stay here, because this is flow scope, and the scope actually ends here. So you can have multiple instances of A. By doing it this way and putting the conditions on, you really have to uh, have the one with the conditions on top. Otherwise, they're being traversed sequentially. If I'm not being clear, then just come afterwards, then maybe. Thank you. Um, yes. Is it possible to have a builder on top of the record? I only know of one way that it's possible, and that's a really awful way, and that is uh, if you use Lombok. Lombok actually allows for builders on the records, but um, the problem is um, normally if you have to build a pattern, but basically what you're doing is you're storing the temporary state until you call the build, and then you create the instance, right? But there's no place here. You're not allowed to define extra instance variables or variables at all. You could just do, you can create statics, but that's really nasty with builder because if then, you know, two access it at the same time. So that's not an option. Lombok uh, does a trick, so I guess it does some bytecode manipulation there under the hoods. Uh, that's really something I'm missing too, that's right, because that would really make records perfect if you could actually have a builder for it, then it looks so much better. Yep. They have to be in the same package. Very good point. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the idea about that has, um, the idea that it has to be in the same class all comes down to the fact that, uh, well, the compiler is reasoning about it, right? And it says, oh, wait a minute, but I permit this one and this one and this one. So, and, and then it has to know at compile time where it is. Um, um, so, yeah, that is actually, and then, especially if you would use modules, then you would get really um, um, confusing situations. So they have, to be, they have to be in the same package name at least. They can be separate files with the same package structure. Uh, so that would still work. Right. Record supports only Sorry? Record supports only oh, oh, no, 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 no. No, because basically, um, we're also using strings in here, which is an object type. No, no, you can have any type in there, and also collection classes. Uh, you can have any type, and a bit later we'll see a few <coughs> examples of where we use that. Um, right. Quick recap. Okay, separate data from logic, blah, blah, these were the principles. I think um, separate data from logic. I think we're good with doing that in Java, right? We could use static methods, which is what Brian Getz says, the language architect, no problem. I know, I know as, as Java developers, we always think, oh, static methods, that's bad because that's not object-oriented programming, right? But it, 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 this is a valid case of using them. Um, like I said, it's not that different to using beans where you already had the split between logic and data. Uh, store data in generic data structures. Um, yeah, we could do that in Java, right? Since Java 9, we have these great methods here. And, and we, could use, we could store a user like this. But it would be crazy to do that, right? Because Java gives us compile time type safety. So um, 
it would be crazy not to mention if you want to get the data out again, you have to create methods to get them out and then cast them to the data type that they are. So that would be crazy. I think we just discovered a better way of using that. Um, then data should be immutable. Mm. I think the same thing we just found, the records, they're immutable by default, so they would be a great match there. And finally, data schema separated from representation. Again, we're using the Java type information. So not really an argument we can look at. So basically, we're looking at separate data from logic. We can see records as generic data structures because they're so thin, right, and so lightweight, you can create like hundreds of them in your application and data should be immutable. Right, going to an, an example then. Eh, one back. Optional, we all know optional, right? Add it to Java in version eight and basically it says, I have a variable here and it might have a value, but it might not, so I don't know. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll better wrap it in an optional and then, well, you figure it out for yourself and then you get this Schrodinger cat situation, right? It could be dead and alive at the same time. So there could be a null in there, or there could be a non-null in there. And normally what you would do, you would check from, if, is it, you could check if there's a value in there, and if there is a value in there, then you can get it out with the get method. Now, Brian Getz suggested if we would have sealed classes, records and pattern matching, uh, by the time we made optionals in Java, he would have designed it like this. So he says, we have a sealed interface, opt, and it's of a generic type, so it can contain any uh, object type in there. And it allows two subclasses. It allows sum with a type T, which is the value of the element, or it allows none, saying there isn't a value in there, so we don't need a value. That would then lead us to writing code like this. Um, so we have a class test. It calls the static main method, the arguments, creates a new instance, passes the arguments, the, run, the command line arguments to the run method, and if we look at it, the run method apparently does a validate with these arguments, gets a value in return, and passes it on to the process method. And if we look here, oh, it returns an opt of a string. Great. And that is being processed then by the process method. So if we look at the implementation then, um, the validate method, mm. So this is what we saw. The validate method comes in and says, okay, if there's no command line arguments, I'll return an obst none. Yeah? Signaling, it's absent. Uh, if there is a command line argument, then we'll pick it up and take the first command line argument and store it in sum. Now, what's really interesting is the processing method because suddenly this is how your code looks then. You can say, okay, I get this optional, and the optional can ever only have two possible values, right? It can only return a sum or a none. And this is really interesting because now basically your data is driving. Um, there's no other outcome possible, so you have limited invalid outcomes. That's not possible anymore. And your code is very, very simple to, to, to follow now because basically this is how you would do it. Either sum or none, you can use in the case so you don't have to check, oh, is there a value in there? Then take it out and do something with it. Um, does this make any sense to anyone? Yeah. With an exceptional exception. Yeah. Oh no, so sorry. No, no, no. Could you the last question again? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the output has always happened because there can only be these outcomes. There is no other outcome possible.
Yes, but in this situation you will have the case handled, otherwise your code won't compile. Uh, you, in the beginning we have told the compiler of the compiler, uh, oh no, actually there we were, go back. The, we said, okay, we have this opt interface that has two return values, either some or none, and those are the only ones, they're implementing the interface, and by setting it up this way and saying they implemented it, that can only be the outcome. No, no other possible outcome. Is, yep. Yeah. Uh, no, um, 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 well, that is not valid because they, we, have, um, we have the validate method and it returns this type, an ops of a string, and ops can only have two values. Null is not a value, not a, not a valid value. You could, of course, create, um, you could create a sum with a none value, but that would be very bad programming. But yeah, then, then theoretically, but then I guess you're really bypassing the process. Um, right. Oh, yep. Um, sometimes this is in theory that I have heard that don't prefer switch cases but use polymorphism. Correct. So why would all of the data really programming have examples? That's a very good question. That's actually the big difference, and the argument is um, polymorphism, which is of course a very good object-oriented principle, is something you would use um, in larger applications where you have large uh, um, um, object hierarchies. Potentially in microservice applications, um, um, your code is way smaller. So um, um, there's not so much hierarchies technically in there. Or if you would use this for just you know, reading some data, doing something with it, passing it on. Um, and that's, um, that's, that's the situations where you would, the cases, and you're true. Uh, it is true, cases, okay, in the past, we had cases, no, 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 we'd rather do a lot of if-elses or something. But I think that's also why they enhance the switch state, uh, the switch functions, actually, I should say, a lot. Um, m more to move towards smaller applications where, again, class hierarchies are not that um, needed or wanted. Um, a final example. Uh, yep. Uh, in the case, you can the same an enum. Yeah. Uh, uh, theoretically, yes, you could. Um, well, in this case, if you would use them all together, um, um, if you would use records, you also get the extra functions of the. Um, um, deconstruction, right, where it takes the values for out for you. And of course you're right, an enum only has a limited set of values. I think an extra additional thing, which um, one of the drawbacks of this solution, but again, one of the things that can easily be solved, if you would decide there would be fourth class of user, a super user, um, all your code would break, right? It would break completely. And it wouldn't break if you would use inheritance, so that, that is true. That you could. But normally if you would add extra a, a user like this it means you're also adding behavior, so you just you don't just want to change this. And by using this and, and showing the compiler will show you every place where you actually forgot to mention the super user, so you, so you can actually change it very quickly, which in case of um, of your enums you won't have. So actually, if you want to enhance the system and enlarge it, the system. This, this, this uh, approach will help you because uh, the compiler is your friend. If I would use an extra enum, the compiler, I don't know if he would complain. Maybe, yeah, he would possibly complain, um, but here definitely too, and he would tell you all the points. Um, so, model, um, one more like real world example. We have uh, this, this REST resource, so this is like a REST resource and it says, great, I uh, have a few methods in there, a search and a create. If we would look at the search, we're basically defining a search interface again. And we have three possible outcomes. We can either have no result because nothing matched the key. We could have uh, only one result, but maybe we search for the primary key, or we search for a name, we could have multiple results, right? And here again, it's a generic class. It can work for everything. And then um, 
we would have a fine project that actually returns a search result, in this case an exact search result, not really that important. But then again, how would we act on it? Um, we would do the search, we would call the find project, and we always would know there's only ever three possible outcomes. Either it's a no result, it's an exact match, or it's a multi-result. And based on that, we can write, again, write code like this. And um, here you see some examples of where we're actually using this record deconstruction again. So in the multi-result, we're saying, great, if it is a multi-result, get me the instance variables and store them in p and count, and I'll pass that on to my method. So you don't have to pass the record on and get all these kinds of things. You can just put the variables on. So this code is very easy, and actually it is really, really reusable because if you think about it, um, it's mainly these methods here that, that need to change. And for the rest, it's very generic code all around. The same could apply for the search method. Uh, uh, sorry, for the create method, because there would be some code like this, right? We get a data in. We validate it, and if it's valid, we're storing it. Now, here again, with this master data, you could define your object hierarchy, and then you can define each of this, how they look. And here's an example that you can actually use also all kinds of types within a record. Uh, there's the activity, and there's the subactivity. But again, if you look at the code, how, to, how you would use it then, the validate method, again, you have to switch. Here you're checking for null because it could be JSON. It could be JSON. And if it's JSON, then uh, maybe it doesn't really uh, match to your record. Then your master data would be null. So that's the first thing you're checking. And otherwise, you can check the code like this. Um, and again, it's very clear and concise code. I think everyone who actually looks at this code can understand what is happening. And it's very nice sequence. And of course, for the um, store method, you would actually have the same idea again. We're just leaving the null out because we know once we reach the point of the store method that it will all be uh, valid values only. And with that, there's a summary. So data-oriented programming teaches, treats data as first-class citizens. You're really making decisions based on your data. Um, so data it treats us as first-class citizens. It drives your application. Uh, it supports data-oriented programming via blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>